Hi, everybody. My name is Marcos Staffney. I'm the executive director for the Montshire Museum of Science, and it's my great pleasure today to host a discussion about the film Coded Bias. Today, we're going to be discussing artificial intelligence, or AI, as we might discuss it throughout this program, and the consequences for the people AI is biased against. So with us today, we're very happy to have Eugene Santos, professor at Thayer School of Engineering for Dartmouth College, Jackie Weinermont, a professor of digital humanities and social engagement for women and gender studies, and Christina Liu, a software engineer for Deep Mind. Now, as we're discussing artificial intelligence, I'd like to just go ahead and start with a deeper understanding of what AI actually is for our audience. Gene, I know we've had a lot of conversations about AI in the past, um, and you serve on a number of agencies that actually are looking at regulation for AI, at least in the state of Vermont. Um, would you mind giving us a little bit of an overview of AI and um, why we might be looking at it to think about how we're being governed with it? Sure. Let me just go ahead and just start with a, a simple definition. Uh, AI can be defined as an algorithm or machine that selects a decision from a number of alternative decisions. So inside of it could be optimizing something. It could be, you know, uh, even doing, you know, recognizing whether is it this individual or not this in individual in facial recognition. And that, of course, has a lot of rec lot of implications because these selections can influence, of course, the human decision maker who are applying the rules and regulations uh, and, you know, d deciding the future impact of individuals in the entire towns and communities. Um, yeah, maybe just to follow that, like a lot of current AI as it exists today isn't, isn't a general intelligence. They're mostly prediction models for uh, yeah, decision making, like Gene said. And the way these occur is basically glorified statistics. So all these machine, all these models require massive amounts of data to train the AI. And therefore, um, the critical point that we see uh, in this documentary is that, you know, data is, isn't, um, data is produced by humans, and obviously humans are biased. And therefore, we see that these AI models propagate the bias that already occurs in the data. Mm. Yeah. And well, go, oh, please yes, go ahead. That, um, build on that and say, right, that one of the things I think sometimes um, gets lost in when we talk about training an, an AI or, or just training an algorithm, right, a learning algorithm, um, and this is part of what Christina was just saying, is it's it's based on data, but that means it's in some ways based on historical data, right? Um, very often the case. So, you know, if we're talking about predictive policing, um, sentencing guidelines, things like that, right? Those are um, data that have um, social and cultural contexts already built into them, right? And that then trains the algorithm with some of the, um, you might think of them as like silent or, or absent attributes um, that are encoded in the data, even if they're not hard coded into the data, right? So you can have data that says nothing about race, but that still communicates racializing categories um, because of sort of historical structures of, of knowledge, et cetera. Um, and I think sometimes people are really afraid of the category of AI, right? It can seem sort of mysterious. Um, and certainly this, you know, the notion that it selects a set of decisions or a decision um, is absolutely right. And, and Jean absolutely knows. Um, sometimes when I'm trying to demystify it for folks, I point out that uh, a recipe is a kind of algorithm insofar as it's a procedure, um, right? It's not the same thing necessarily as a, as a, a, a learning algorithm, um, but that, that sort of procedural um, logic is really important. That's a really great example with the recipe. And it, while it may not seem like it's learning from machine learning, uh, the one thing, you know, one example, like in baking, why did I mix these two ingredients and suddenly this happened? Yep. So the AI suffers from that. It sees the procedure, but doesn't understand why it happens. You know, and then, you know, great bakers have a good idea. At least they can explain what's going on. At least they've experienced it enough. But yeah, that's one of the biggest problems from the historical data. Yep. So just a, as an overview, because this particular film is showcasing some challenging things uh, with bias, what are some really positive things that are happening with AI right now that, that are helping us? And why is there such a move to have AI uh, 
sort of proceed right now. So many people might be even scared of AI or they, they, they might be thinking like our computers are going to take over the world, but, uh, but, it, but it is helping us in some instances. What are some of the helpful things AI can do right now? Well, I can offer, um, so I actually was just teaching about this. I am uh, teaching a class right now called Social Justice and Computing, and we were talking about um, you know, some of the challenges that occur um, with machine learning and algorithmic thinking. Um, and the students said, well, uh, you know, why are we bothering if, if it's all sort of, if there are so many troubles? Um, and of course, there are, there are lots of ways in which we might think about algorithmic processes speeding up um, certain um, uh, calculations or, or discoveries, right? Um, you think about, you know, large, you know, attempting to sift through a very large um, volume of texts, right? Um, I was mentioning today, I do a lot of work around hate speech on the internet, right? And the mm -hmm. efforts that are often thwarted um, because this, it turns out speech is very context specific, um, but the, the efforts to try to identify um, hate speech on the internet in part so that we can decrease the harms that it's causing, right, um, to the, mm. the actual targets. But part of the reason that we might want to use something like AI is that content uh, screeners, right, people who are working for Facebook, this is Sarah Roberts's work, um, has been so really um, important for pointing this out. The people who have been tasked by major social media companies to do that content screening themselves are suffering both primary and secondary trauma as a result of that, right? And so if we can use a machine um, to do some of that screening, that could be of real benefit. Uh, I was a computer science student at Dartmouth, and for my senior's honor thesis, I wrote about how basically uh, how we can use machine learning models, specifically natural language processing models, to detect TERFs on Twitter. And if you don't know what TERFs are, they're basically uh, a specific subset of transphobes on social media that have very specific dog whistles and hate speech they use. And so my work was basically in how can we train a model to automatically detect accounts that use this kind of language and perhaps protect um, trans communities on social media. Uh, my work was done with a professor um, at the medical school who would use machine learning models in the health sphere, which I think is a very large benefit to AI. Um, a very, a very useful sphere to apply machine learning because, you know, we usually see that doctors need to sift through mountains of data, be it like x-ray visual data, like x-rays, or um, yeah, all sorts of like numbers and whatnot. And therefore, we can see that this is a really good application for machine learning to, you know, predict whether someone has, a, like someone's cancer prognosis or someone's um, yeah, different medical predictions uh, mm -hmm. can be done well using machine learning algorithms. I think we also sort of take for granted now machine translation, helping people communicate between different languages. I mean, it's still rough. We have some very funny examples, you know, take English, translate to, you know, uh, Russian and then translate to Chinese and back to English, you're not going to get the same thing. But it's an important start. It helps us understand. And I think some of the most interesting studies out there is that why are these mistakes happening? What does the mistakes themselves mean? And so that's, I think, one of the, to me, one of the benefits that I actually didn't expect to see. You know, I started my career a long time ago. And it's like machine translation. No, I don't think so. Too much meaning. But wow, the, what they've managed to do. You know, I think that this film does such a great job of illustrating the, the spaces where um, racial bias in particular, right, has been sort of baked into particular algorithms, right? Um, but there is, a, a, I think, a subset of folks who are thinking not how can we empower those who are already empowered, right? So if we're thinking about predictive policing or sentencing guidelines, right, you're thinking there about the, the kind of... Um, police and state apparatus um, being empowered by um, algorithms. You can instead think about algorithms that are, are speaking back to power, right? So um, there are some lawyers who are doing some really great work at data and society thinking about, well, how can we use AI to sift through the judgments of judges, right? Who are, mm -hmm. they're sentencing judgments. And can we find problematic patterns in those sentencing judgments, right? So I think one of the things that we can do is think about 
places where we can use the tools to invert or address some of the power dynamics rather than exacerbate them. Yeah, yeah I mean, me, I think like- Go ahead. We, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Jack. It's okay. We can think about the the, the set of um, biases that are, are strong in any of our cultures, right? Um, and so if we're talking about sort of Western Anglophone co- cultures, um, right, uh, racial racializing biases, um, gendering biases, um, biases towards um, the the sort of heteronormative, um, right? Um, anything that's attempting to predict based on past patterns is going to have, as I suggested earlier, some of those past patterns encoded into it, right? And so, if you're if you've got something that's um, assuming that everyone uh, who you know, is taking a pregnancy test wants to be pregnant, for example, um, this was a, a very popular media um, present example, um, then you start to send out, you know, advertisements and, and coupons to the home based on that, right? But that that's not always the case, right? There are, are plenty of situations where um, they might not have the majority response, right? And so anytime you're thinking about predictive analytics, that's a, a certain challenge. Um, I also think one of the things that we probably don't talk about enough is that there is an Anglophone bias, Um, right, in a lot of this. And so, um, you know, whether or not AI is working the same um, in Asia, where it's being deployed um, against Uyghur populations, right, and how that is is operating. You know, I mean, I think um, we need to think about the the particular contexts in which any set of algorithms is being deployed and the data that it's been trained on. I think it's really interesting to see specifically these days how models handle, like, for example, there's many models dedicated, especially in the advertisement space, to gender prediction. And we can see that, you know, this is a way that um, bias can be baked into models without it existing in the data. So in the classes that the model is trained on, like, if you're going to train a model on two genders, you know, women and men, then that's going to leave out, um, for example, non-binary people and whatnot. And so... Yeah, so we see that bias is not is not only baked in through the data, but also in the creator of the model and what they decide to make the categories as. So queer people and non-binary people in particular um, see themselves at basically like they're the countless in the model. The, we're trying to count the countless basically. And so when you don't even exist as a category for the model to be trained on, um, and this can happen a lot, especially in like text. When we, when a challenge in natural language processing is to do like um, co-references, which is basically like in a sentence, like he went to the market. Who does he refer to? Obviously, these models will rely on gender as a crutch. But then, how does that, how does, how does that, how does a model extrapolate for non-binary people? Um, and therefore, we can see that gender bias, in particular, is particularly harmful to non-binary people because of the way the data is baked and actually, as you said, an important part is the way data is curated. The thing that we're missing at this time is, you know, nobody's defining sort of the guidelines or thought processes that goes into, and I said, I shouldn't say nobody's not that there's nobody not defining, Uh, but it's not usually considered. The data is just thrown in. This is the ease of data that I can get a hold of. And unless somebody's looking carefully at just that distribution, your issue of you know people not being counted is going to crop up. And then the poor algorithm, of course, doesn't know any better. It'll happily think that this is what's representative. And let me add one thing on top. So this is also ties back to, you know, Jack and we were talking about recipes. Uh, the, the machine learning algorithms is trying to learn the set of features it thinks works best in terms of identifying something. And we don't understand which features. And many times, you know, the, the features that are being exploited are just crazy. Uh, you know, a simple example is like, um, let's say I'm trying to identify uh, this picture has lizards that are sunbathing. Okay. And well, it turns out pretty much all the pictures where they're sunbathing is a sunny day. And pictures where they aren't, there's no lizard sunbathing is not a sunny day. So, well, if I was a smart aleck kid, like a, a machine learning algorithm, I can easily identify that with high probabilities that, oh, it's a sunny day. Hence, there's a sunbathing lizard. And so, you know, these are things that the curators, the developers of AI need to lay out their intentions and their assumptions. And 
Well, it's going to be a big challenge for a while because AI is a black box, especially when the things like these deep learning stuff, deep neural networks, they have to start really digging in and say that this is what underlies all this. This is why it's coming up with this decision choice versus this other one. Uh, so, you know, we're talking about the the different kinds of biases that can that can be represented. And I think um, in addition to thinking about the biases that can be represented, um, thinking about uh, where the data sources are coming from and what the ethical implications are of those data sources, right? So Gene um, just pointed to what is in some ways, um, one way to describe part of what he's pointing to is, is a kind of sample size issue, right? That um, you may have a, a data set that you're training an algorithm on that has um, really good representation of a particular population, but is relatively quiet on another. And you may supplement your, you may know this, right? And you may supplement your, um, training data with a smaller data set, right, to get at a particular attribute of some sort. But you, if you don't have a match in the training data size, um, right, you have a sample size problem. And that sample size problem can produce errors that are very difficult to detect. Um, I'll, I'll also mention that the, the, the kind of ethical source problem um, that I was just talking about, so NIST, which is our national organization um, on standards and technology, I think is uh, the uh, acronym there. Um, I recently wrote a piece um, with Nikki Stevens and Oz Keys about NIST's use of training data or creation of training data sets that are distributed globally, right? Um, that are drawn from um, sex trafficking cases, um, child abuse cases, and other police data sets, right? So these are facial recognition data sets that people are running their algorithms on that are data sets of already harmed and exploited persons. Um, and they're really, I mean, there's there's anonymization, right? So we're not necessarily talking about a risk of, of identification and many of them are historical data sets. So the subjects um, would already be dead. Uh, but, you know, I think there's still a question of, you know, does a person who has already been harmed have some right to not simply become fodder for global AI training? Mm. Um, I would argue, yeah, um, right? I, I don't think, um, you know, the, the submission of images for something like solving a case of child sex trafficking does not mean that there's a blanket permission to use it for any other purpose going forward. Right. Um, and so thinking about where permissions and rights lie um, and who's being harmed, if we're not thinking about that, if we just suddenly think about people's faces as data, once it's in there, we can use it. Um, I think that's a real challenge. I think this is bringing up a really great question for me about who is curating both the question and then the answers that come from it or the predictive uh, modeling that comes from it. I, I was really struck by the scene in the movie in Great Britain where there was a truck and it had facial recognition software and the police were forcing people to walk down the street and be identified by this particular facial recognition software. Well, who is, you know, what, how do we know uh, what's being asked of us as we walk past something and who's getting to make those decisions? And it brings me to like a larger question that maybe you could address as a group about representation in that curation, like who's getting to be at the table when it comes to curating the, the questions that now we have the ability to collect the data. Um, so I'll leave it at that, like who, who's getting to do this and how do we change the story of, of making it a broader representation? Let me, let me take a stab at first. So Marcus, you know, it, it ties all the way back. You're asking about regulations and stuff. It, it has to bring on board both the users and the creators. So if it's the government looking at implementing a policy, implementing a technology, they have to be part of that discussion. They have to also understand the implications of when it goes right and when it goes wrong, of course. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things that we spent a fair amount of time with on the, uh, uh, the, the Vermont task force I was on was thinking about, well, where should we go at this? And one of our first recommendations is that we need to make sure we adopt some sort of, you know, a code of ethics for artificial intelligence. And that at least gives you a first framework for people to start thinking about. Um, I just remember the meetings that we had, the public hearings, we got questions in every direction. And, you know, when it's that scattered without some framework like that, it's, it's harder to focus down to see what's really important. 
And Gina, just to break in, I, I, I think because um, I attended one of those hearings, it was fascinating to me about how many people didn't come to, to those hearings. And do you think there's a bigger problem with just awareness that AI like can be doing these types of things? Like how? Right, right. I think so. But, you know, uh, the, 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 the way I've seen it is that people make many assumptions about AI and misunderstand them. Actually, there's several studies out there. Of, you know, they think they understand AI, but then when you ask them, do you have AI on you? Some, most people say no. I said, what's your smartphone, right? I mean, that's a simple one. So there's that disconnect in the perception. And then the other part is, you know, it's sort of changing ideals. Um, one thing I'll say is that, you know, uh, I, I believe you and I are in a generation where uh, how much information we're willing to opt into providing is different than the current generation. So there is a struggle that without a code of ethics, uh, are we exploiting something? You know, I, you know, one of, one of the biggest caches of knowledge, so to speak, that a lot of AI research got really excited in the past 10, 20 years is, wow, Facebook data, Twitter data. It's like, that's suddenly all available. But we got to think about the implications. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right, right? The And this is in some ways a question um, about what constitutes the public sphere today, right? And where do we draw the lines with respect to things that we might think of as surveillance technologies, right? Um, and and there are trade-offs. And I think very often the trade-offs are intentionally hidden from the consumer, right? Um, Jean used the, the phrase black box. Um, I think there are a lot of these black boxes sort of operating um, today. And, you know, you might think of something like a nest system, right? Has a certain kind of environmental impact. It's often sold as something that can optimize your home, right? Um, but that's also generating a significant amount of data about an extraordinarily intimate space, right? Um, the same is true for an Alexa, right? Alexa as a, a kind of always on listening um, uh, machine, right? And there are real questions in the in the legal sphere right, about whether or not um, Alexa data, A, can be subpoenaed and B, can count as evidence, and if so, what kind of evidence. Um, but we also see this with things like smartwatches, right, that are generating an extraordinary amount of data. And I think um, given how much um, various sort of listening, watching, seeing technologies have made their way into our everyday life, we do need a populace that's, that's um, aware right, and technology literate, but we need legal frameworks that can keep up, um, which we don't currently have. Um, and, and we need to think about what constitutes the public sphere, right? I mean, I think a lot of people um, would argue that social media data is not there for, you know, it's not free speech out there for anyone to data mine, right? People are having conversations with what they consider to be their community in many of these cases. Um, and so, like, does that constitute a data set? Some people begin to feel real wiggly about that. And particular communities, right? Um, I think here about the, the case of Black Twitter, um, right? Where you've got women in particular, women and, and um, trans people in the Twitter sphere who are generating an enormous amount of content that's then being harvested for a, an array of different purposes, um, which was certainly not their intention and rarely comes to benefit them. Yeah, I think particularly thinking about surveillance, I think it's important to think of the distinction between like corporations, like corporate surveillance and state surveillance. And both of these are entities that use um, use models to accomplish this. And obviously, like corporate surveillance, yeah, like it's awful, but it's usually profit driven, probably mostly to see like, OK, how best can we sell your data for advertisements or, you know, to generate revenue. And then, so that I think is a little bit tough to legislate. Um, I think there is, I think I particularly like to focus on state surveillance. So how is the state using models to either, particularly in the sphere of policing, like predictive policing. And so I think we can look to like really good work done by the ACLU of Washington um, for the Seattle surveillance ordinance. And so that, I think, is a really great model on how um, policy can be used to control surveillance for, for the, um, yeah, to control state surveillance. 
So this ordinance basically says, and, and it actually brings it to the community and says like, okay, like the impacted community and tells them you, they have to be very clear about what, um, what the police are using to surveil you and there's like a very strict approval process. And through this process, it was revealed that there are even things like, um, you know, cell phone, cell phone towers, cell phone data can be used to track you and all sorts of different things that can be revealed. And so I think, yeah, obviously both corporate and state surveillance um, are intertwined problems, but I think tech policy that focuses on state surveillance has can be very effective in my opinion. Hmm. I think my next set of questions might look at this issue from a spectrum of what would you recommend? Uh, what would you recommend to the legislative bodies you need to govern, to the curators or creators of the questions and the analyzers of the data? And what would you recommend to the user uh, to, to think about this? And we can maybe take these one at a time, but uh, we've been talking about governance in general. Like what, what might you recommend as, as people who are in this world that people really, that, that that legislators, like who may not necessarily be as aware about AI as as um, computer scientists, uh, like what 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 should they be really thinking about? I can start off. How about two things: transparency, which many people understand, and second, mm -hmm. abdication. How much are you abdicating your decision? Do you understand why you're abdicating your decision? I mean, it's like the it's like the funny adage everything on the internet's true so i think any of the users and the legislators must take that into account yeah i would um say that there are um so there's a, a, a conference that's sort of organized uh, around this acronym around of fairness accountability and transparency right the fact uh, conference as it's now known. And I think this is a, a space where we need if algorithmic processes, machine learning is a space where we need more of that, right? And it, it pushes against the, the kind of black boxing um, that we were talking about earlier, where everything is sort of hidden inside a neat, a neat package and no one knows how things work. So from a kind of policy and governance perspective, I think, um, you know, demanding that uh, whether it's state surveillance or corporate surveillance, new technology coming out of institution like uh, you know research institutions or being um, advanced by corporations, I think we need to think about how how can fairness and accountability be judged, right? What degree of transparency has been built in, and how can we demand more, um, right? There are, are processes that people are starting to come up with called algorithmic audits. There are other kinds of processes that people are talking about. But if you've got, you know, someone in front of you who says, I have this system, it, it turns out these really great results, but I can't tell you how it works. I think that's an area to be really concerned. And I think that's true across fields. You know, policing is obviously a um, an important one, but um, Dr. Bolawami's work began in part because she was thinking about um, detecting melanoma, right, on dark skin, um, and the the need to be able to have um, computer vision be able to deal with lots of different skin types, right? And so thinking about um, transparency um, uh, sort of across the spectrum where we might use machine learning and um, uh, AI. Yeah, it's funny you bring up that conference because I actually attended it in Barcelona this year, before mm -hmm. last year, before everything <clears throat> kind of went down COVID wise. And yeah. so, yeah, I think that was a really amazing conference that showed like, OK, there are many people working in this space trying to tackle all sorts of questions. Um, and I think there is a disconnect in the field between like very like many people who come into it with the technological background are like, OK, like how can we, you know, algorithmically remove racism from our model and then you have people coming from who, from like the social sciences from sociology who want to like integrate critical theory critical race theory into the work and there, and i think that is kind of the way to go instead of being like thinking about okay how can we like fix this algorithm we should be thinking about should this algorithm even be used or should it be dismantled like and that's kind of how I feel about things like automatic facial recognition um, 
And I think the field is slowly tra- starting to reach the point of instead of questioning, like, how do we, you know, de-bias the model? They're actually thinking about, should this model even be used in the first place? And I think that is a sort, sort of conversation that people should be having in the sphere. I think that is a great um, sort of introductory question for legislators to think about, right? Should we actually use this algorithm? And then from that, um, the, what is the transparency? What are we willing to abdicate? Um, and what is the fairness in which it's applied? I think these are all really great things for our governing bodies to be thinking about as um, AI starts to progress. Now, what about for the curators or for the, the people who are making this? Is, is it the same? Um, Christina, you just gave a great example of like all the wants and needs of individual social science researchers who are trying to think about how AI can expedite their studies or could um, give a different data set um, to then make you know outcomes based. Um, uh, just just to give us some like, sorry, like outcomes based things, but like they're thinking of outcomes based off of the data. What what do you think you know curators should be more mindful of? And I use the term curator, but like I guess programmers and and yeah. people who are working on this. I think uh, there are certain frameworks that people have been suggesting. Um, I think there's one called Data Sheets for Datasets by like Timnit Gebru from Google and a bunch of other researchers formerly Georgia Tech and Corna. Oh, formerly Google, right. There was some <laughs> drama around that. But mm-hmm. yeah, so like lots of frameworks, like not only looking at like how is this data collected, who is labeling the data, um, the thought process behind that, but also like kind of trying to pick apart every step of the model creation and seeing like how bias can be embedded. Because like I mentioned previously, it's not it's not just the data. Like a lot of researchers like, like to say that, oh, it's just the data that, that's biased, but that's really not the case. Like you can see human judgment seeps through in through every single layer of the decision-making process when creating these models. And so I think it definitely falls in the hands of researchers at mostly we see like researchers in academia and researchers at the big research labs. Um, in Google, Microsoft Research, um, whatnot, to kind of prioritize these things instead of, you know, ethics washing and just trying to uh, ship out the ship out the most predictive fancy model. Yeah, I would. Um, you know, part of the reason that I, I said, um, you know, Timnit Gebru, formerly of Google, right, is because that has been a really um, very high profile mess, I think, that Google got itself into, right? Um, and part of Gebru's argument is that she was essentially terminated um, pretty unceremoniously and pretty unethically um, for being a strident Black woman who constantly pushed Google to be better about ethics and AI, right? And the the paper in question um, where the, the sort of firing action happened was, I think, a, 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 a paper that brings in a, another part of this conversation that we haven't talked about, a paper that thought about the, the environmental costs of natural language processing on huge data sets, right? And one of the things that we know is not only um, are some of these computationally intensive processes um, very energy intensive also, right? But data storage centers, you know, the cloud is not in, in the sky. It's in low income neighborhoods where uh, companies have been able to buy up land, often displacing black and brown people, right? Um, and so I think you know part of what Gebru points us to is, is both the set of things that she was looking at, but also this reality that within CS, um, we are actually going backwards in terms of, of effective uh, or, or diversity in many ways, right? So the number of women graduating with CS degrees in the United States is actually lower now than it was in the mid 80s, right? So we are going backwards, not forwards. Um, and and we're not talking just about, you know, gender parity, we need to think about a range of different, um, right, gender identities, sexual identities, mm. um, class and race backgrounds, right? Because part of what this movie highlights is that It took someone sitting at the table and having the machine literally not be able to see her face, right? That's not an imaginative exercise that you can sort of design, think your way around. That's a a phenomenon, right? Um, And so we need to work harder to understand what's what's going on that these people aren't already at the table, 
right? Mm -hmm. Why are they being sort of systematically excluded in the way that, that Gabru is, is pointing us to? And how can we change the system so that we do have the right set of people at the table? Yeah, let me add to that in that, you know, the, the question on the curators, the creators, you know, having the inherent bias. Well, in the end, any algorithm we build, somebody's selecting components. And if we want to just talk about the math, somebody selected this function. Yep. Why this function? And people don't explain it. You know, uh, sometimes the function, it could be expedience, which is the wrong way, of course, to design an algorithm if you want to have it understandable. So back to the code of ethics, back to some framework, we need to have that. So people interrogate it. Uh, you know, CS, you know, for a long time has always had these things such as what's the proper way to develop software? I have to say that I don't see that happening very often in AI. And well, okay, so this is both good and bad, good from the point of view that, you know, there's all these little scripts, all these little libraries that people can start playing with AI right away, which is awesome, and, you know, from, from a learning educational standpoint, but it's also not awesome because I don't know how many times I said, I'm gonna apply X to Y. Why? Is it working? It says, yeah. Are you sure? And then you get lost there. Yeah, I think building on that, like one important thing is when people try to apply AI to like social context to people, that's where most of the flaws become most evident. Um, yeah, it's just like, you know, I think there are many things that AI is good at, but I think when it comes to categorizing people and categorizing more um, fluid categories is where it becomes kind of like what snake oil you know like they're just selling you something that really that it it doesn't it, it shouldn't it shouldn't work or it's like yeah it's basically just you know computational stereotyping hmm. i mean so what i'm hearing from this conversation is that for the developers and the creators and um the curators of this that they really need to be asking um and really defining the types of data that they're asking for in the beginning. We need to know who's at the table and why are we reversing the cycle of um, diversity and sort of like going back into more, I guess, a, a cis white male uh, uh, space um, for developing this. And then how are we developing the software? Like how, like how, how are we figuring this out? Um, that's a, it's a, it's a great questions to ask for people who are curating this content. Um, so the last question in, in this sort of spectrum is like, what should I care about? Like what should um, like the general user be really thinking about um, as you know, you want to participate, right? You want to participate in Instagram and you want to share those photos and you want to use uh, your Sonos with Alexa and you want to use all of these things because there's modern conveniences that come with it. But what should we be mindful of? I talk a lot with my students um, about understanding that, that there is no such thing as a free service in, in, in digital internet land, right? Um, if, it's, if it's free, uh, you're paying, you know, the phrase is, or the, the saying is, um, it's not free, you're paying with your data, right? And so to be mindful of that, um, there is... I think often, particularly for the generation um, that are, are my students right now, um, a sense of like, well, that's okay. I mean, my data is all out there. I'm not too worried about it. And I, that's fine. Um, that's a, you know, people get to make up their own, um, they get to judge their own sense of risk vis-a-vis -vis their data being out in the world and being circulated. But I try to remind them that not everybody feels safe having their data out there, right? So, um, right, there are, and this is, the movie does a great job of showing this, there are people for whom, right, simply walking down the street means that they are subject to scrutiny, right? There are people for whom using daily devices that are devices of convenience for many of us um, may actually be much more like devices of surveillance, right? And so to, if people feel like they're okay with their data being out there, I think they might wanna ask themselves, what conditions of privilege, what, what sort of opportunities or affordances are, are available in their life and in our, our culture that make them feel safe, that might make others feel unsafe? 
Yeah, maybe just building on that, especially I think for, you know, my generation, Gen Z, there really is no kind of opt out from social media or from, you know, from existing online. Even if you don't have these, if you don't, even if, if you don't have a Facebook account, they still manage to monitor you. And so I think what is most important on kind of a personal level is a like spreading awareness and be kind of putting pressure on legislation and to create policy frameworks. Um, either through government, such as like the European uh, GDPR um, and different acts on how data can be collected is, I think, the m most important thing that can be done currently. Yeah, I, I think those are mo two of the most important ones, you know, yeah, the awareness of the collection and then empathy, you know, empathy of the other people around you. And then one other thing I will just add on top of that back to thoughtfulness, think through, think through what the implications are. Think through by, you know, it, you, you could have a situation, your data can actually potentially be used to harm somebody else. So those I think are important things to be in mind for the user. I think this is such an interesting conversation. And just to summarize, we, we talked about recognizing risk and privilege um, of who can and use and produce this kind of data, um, spreading awareness and putting pressure on legislators to make sure that there are governing principles to help protect vulnerable groups, and then being mindful. Gene, that is such a, uh, a, re a revelation in terms of that data can be used against you and you could actually harm somebody else and uh, by by what you post or by how you're utilizing the data such such great thoughts from all three of you on this um from a legislative a creator and a user standpoint um so so with that i think we're almost at the end of our conversation so i'd love to just get any final thoughts about um this uh, the movie coded bias or what um, what what is it that you would love for people to get out of this film or um, out of this conversation? I guess I can go first. So what I'll say is this. I want people to think about intentions. Everything that happens in there, there is some intention. What is that intention? Think deeper on it. And it's intention both from the creator, from the user, from government, every direction, if you can. Yeah, I would build on what Gene's saying and say that um, intention matters, as does impact, right? So one may uh, intend for something to do X, Y, or Z good thing, um, but if the impact is is negative or creates precarity for people, one needs to, to be alive to that and to be able to hear that feedback. Um, yeah, understand that that the impact matters a great deal, and it may not be visible uh, in the design process or even in the initial rollout process, um, but may need to be addressed later. Yeah, totally agree. So yeah, just being more critical about the role that technology plays in your life. And I think kind of really following through each uh, existence of algorith algorithmic bias to the end. So I think the crux of the documentary where they're talking about how facial recognition doesn't work too well for black faces, then, you know, the question that poses is, do you want facial recognition to work that well on black faces? Do you want it to work well on anyone? And so I think, you know, just asking these questions, following through about who is who is taking the data? What are, what are they trying to do with it? And um, yeah, just being a very conscious consumer, I think is the most important. Thank you for those great thoughts, everyone. So again, in summary, intention matters, impact matters, and then be critical about the role of technology in our life. And to go back to our thought of mindfulness, just being mindful overall about how you're being affected and how you might affect others. Uh, this has been a really amazing conversation. Uh, this film has given us a lot to think about. So I hope many people see Coded Bias and think deeply about the role of technology in our lives. Jackie, Christina, Jean, I want to thank you so much. Again, I'm Marco Staffney from the Montshire Museum of Science. And uh, we hope that you think deeply about technology. And we hope that you get to see this great film. Ooh. All right, cut. <laughs> <laughs>